Let's do it. Go live. Are we live? I think we're live. Good evening, Dungeon Masters. It is evening, right? Yeah, there's a fireplace. It's evening. Good evening, Dungeon Masters. I'm Bear Under Up. I am joined by Kelsey Dion of the Arcane Library. Hello. In fact, I'm not joined. I'm joining her yes. in her house right now. He got into my house and I let him stay <laughs> for a minute. <laughs> so, I don't know what we're getting into today. We're going to talk about uh, how Kelsey dissected and analyzed and thought through all kinds of different games in order to make Shadow Dark what it is today. Kelsey, thanks for jumping on my channel with me. Thanks and, for doing this. And letting me into your house. This is so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to answer the door after all. No. Um, this is fun. I decided to wear a blazer because someone's not wearing his. Yeah, but someone <laughs> is also not providing Shadow Dark or uh, Sting Bat plushies. I know, I need to do that. That's so. on the docket. So, <laughs> eventually. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah, this is the first like post Kickstarter. Like, the Kickstarter is pretty much done. So, yeah. this is my first discussion after it's truly what I would call complete now. So, it's interesting. Yeah? Yeah. So, how was the Kickstarter? It, it was the most eventful year of my life, probably. Right. Yeah, very life-changing. Can, so. can you estimate how many emails you have received from various backers? Like, I, in the last two weeks, like probably 600. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's mostly good stuff, right? It, it or is, is it yeah. like, you know, there was a problem with shipping. It's <laughs> it, probably a little more towards the there's a problem with shipping side, but that's kind right. of to be expected. Yeah, so yeah, 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 but a lot of really nice emails too, honestly, just really nice messages. And I mean, if we're, if we're counting messages, Kickstarter messages and emails and like comments, it's like well over a thousand that I, in the last couple of weeks. So it's been wild. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Oh man. Okay. So let's talk about Shadow Dark. Yes. Like how do do? Oh, by the way, before we get started, before we talk about Shadow Dark, I'm running another uh, fundraiser for my favorite charity, Develop Africa. They send money to for school supplies to developing cities and developing communities in uh, West Africa. And uh, they also started doing microloans, which sounds like $50. Sounds really silly and it seems odd for a charity to do that. There's zero interest though. But the idea is that you just give a family like 50 bucks and that gets them into a position where they can afford like one tool that's stopping them from being able to provide for their family in what we would perceive as, you know, a, a very menial job. But in Africa, this might be a comfortable working class profession, like making charcoal, but you need a chainsaw to do that. So anyway, if you can donate money to Develop Africa, that'd be awesome. And I don't know, maybe I'll do a feat of strength for every 100000 or 100000 $100 worth of money we raise. Okay, I don't know what that looks like. <laughs> He'll show you how tall, how tall he is in real life, which is very tall. I'm not but, that tall. I, I mean, don't know, you're tall. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hello? I'm not like Taryn Pounds in Destructo Boy. He's like six foot 13 or something. Taryn is two yeah. people standing on their shoulders together. Yeah, he, that, he is, yeah. he's riding four goblins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, but Develop Africa is a super worthy cause. We raised for it before. Yeah, And it's, it's sure. very satisfying to know that the amount that we raise it really makes a genuine impact in people's lives. It's not just like, this is enough to buy like, you know, two things for one family. It's a lot for yeah. them. Yeah, no, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like $1 is 10 pencils. Yeah. So yeah. think about that. How many, and this is, some of these communities just don't have access to supply chains for, to get pencils. There is no Walmart. Nah, nah, so. Well. So here we are, but well, okay. <laughs> Shadow Dark. Ah, let's talk about it. Let's, let's, all right. let's, let's do the thing. How do how do we how did you go about deciding that Shadow Dark needed to exist? Let's start there. Why is Shadow Dark? Why why was it a shower thought? Yeah. Okay. So I at first didn't want to write it because I was like I can't do that. Like first of all, it's a, it's a bit silly. It's I think that a lot of game designers eventually write their own system whether or not they intend to publish it, and it's kind of like a rite of passage. And so I was like, oh my God, this is happening to me. Oh no, no, I'm an adventure writer. I, I don't want to write a system. So I um, spent a lot of time searching around for what I wanted to adopt as my sort of like old school style or like exploration style focus system because I wanted to write some adventures in that vein. And I'm just too picky. <laughs> I'm just too picky. I hunted around and I ended up just not being ready to fully adopt certain systems that I found because I had some philosophical things that I wanted to implement that I would have had to really house rule a lot, like enough that it would have been cumbersome. 
And so then I started to be like, oh, no, now I'm going to have to write my own, aren't I, to address all these things. And um, it started to grow out of that notion, you know, that I really wanted to do something super custom for the gameplay style that I wanted. And it was like kind of my thesis statement on old school gaming. That's cool. My own thesis statement on it. So yeah. what would you say, and I'm sure like we all have an idea of like some of the larger inspirations, but, you know, there might be some shockers in there. What would you say when you were shopping around? And deciding that you would have to like heavily homebrew specific systems to staple onto other systems in order to get it to do what you wanted. What were what were some of the standout systems that you were looking at uh, as you were like decomposing, recomposing in that process? What? Yeah. Th so there were pro there were three that I was almost going to try to adapt for these adventure writing projects, and because they're all three very great, very great systems, I love them all. Um, the first one was ICRPG, which is probably <laughs> Shadow Dark's closest brother, and there's a lot of cross-pollination between both games, and um, Hank over at Runehammer has been pro probably my greatest game design Jedi Yoda master um, in the industry, and so there's a ton of cross-pollination there. Um, and I, I love and play a ton of index card RPGs still, but I was like, well, I wanted to make something that leaned a little bit more into the classic dungeon crawler feel, and... Hank purposely did not design ICRPG to do that. It's a much more scene-based, like dynamic, semi-like combat focused thing. And any game has role-playing potential outside of that. So, you know, that, that wasn't a thing, but it was more like the way that you go about exploring a space. I wanted to bring in some classic D&D &D methods for that. Um, I also looked at Five Torches Deep. Okay. Because it was kind of like the the flagship 5e old school crossover and it was really it's really cool it has a lot of phenomenal ideas for modernizing old school gaming in it um but i ended up having a few things that i would have changed actually so many things that i would have changed especially about like spell casting and character progression that i ended up being like ah you know i'm gonna have to go my own way on this and then dungeon crawl classics which Ooh, what did you pull from dungeon crawl classics specifically i loved the the roll to cast system okay which i i I want to say that DCC did that first formally, but a lot of other systems have adopted it since then. Like Index Card RPG has rolled a cast, and plenty of other systems do. Um, but I also, I think a, a, maybe the free spirited sort of uh, embracing of the old school and the sword and sorcery and the zany mm -hmm. really was like DCC was a game that showed me like you can pick a vibe and lean into it and enjoy it and like. That, that was actually something that I really took from DCC was the, the willingness to adopt a vibe in a sort of unapologetic like sword and sorcery, like high <laughs> adventure, like, you know, like a tone, like choosing a tone for the game and sticking with right. it. Mm -hmm. So it made, a, it made the vibe check, everybody. Yeah, it passed the vibe test. My, <laughs> wife, said, my wife doesn't know how to play D&D hardly at all. So she'll be like, hey, I, I, saw, I heard you were playing. I heard you failed your vibe check. <laughs> you know? She's going to write her own game someday. One day. Mm -hmm. One day. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what system or like, can you talk more about like what systems and ideas that you saw that you definitely pulled into Shadow Dark from those games? Yeah. That like if, if those games were not, uh, if those games weren't sufficient to do the kind of game that you wanted to play and wanted to express at your table, what, what got cobbled together? from those games into Shadow Dark. Yeah, one of, one of the big things that made its way into Shadow Dark was sort of the, I mean, um, um, the modernizing philosophy of games like ICRPG, where you, you threw an enormous amount of at-the-table gameplay, which is what Hank did to develop ICRPG, he began to notice um, ways to make gameplay faster and more efficient, ways to make sort of the sticking points of D&D that we all kind of didn't realize we Hated, a little bit more efficient <laughs> like slightly more abstracted movement is a huge innovation i think does karen do that too karen karen does it yeah, yeah and i think um i think the black hack does that too yes. and like that's a huge innovation in my opinion okay. it, it, it completely reduces the pain points of measurement that i feel when i'm running and so i first encountered that in icrpg and i was like this is like really cool um simplified reliance on skill checks or not relying on skill checks at all, really, just reducing that down to ability scores. I, I feel like that's a good direction that that game design was moving because 
we, we reached this huge high point of like super skill proliferation in third edition and like Pathfinder. <laughs> yeah. And it was like maximal. It was as much as it could be. And then it got, it's been condensed down over time throughout the editions of D&D. And I think the third party indie sphere has also been moving in that direction because it makes more sense. It's actually more freeing. So the games mm. that I was admiring really had very like low complexity skill systems. And I was like, this is a really useful thing for freeing up player um, autonomy. You know, it's like, here's not a menu of things you can do, but rather you can do whatever you can imagine. Um, so that was from ICRPG2, and to a certain extent, I think DCC. Okay. Not really a skill system in there, if I can recall. Cool. Um, gosh, what else? Um, making sure that action economy doesn't get bogged down, right? That's mm -hmm. like a more modern thing, too, and you're seeing that across some of the games that I was particularly um, inspired by, like, you do like one action or maybe two the, at the most on your turn and the speeds up gameplay. Yeah. So yeah. So a lot of those things were like percolating up through the design space at large. So like I, I've never, it's so funny. I, I don't think I've ever, some people have said that I've claimed that shadow dark is like revolutionary and I've never, I've never claimed that. I think that it's maybe a distillation, but it's really not a lot of new stuff. Yeah, I, no, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it, it very clearly synthesized what, like in a 5e adjacent language, what mm -hmm. the OSR was about or what old school gaming looked like mm -hmm. and present, represented that in the best possible way to modern audiences, basically. That's what I was and hoping it, to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, really... it very much looks like that. <laughs> and there are a lot of decisions made because of nostalgia about mm -hmm. about D D, like um, one way that I diverted away from other games that surrounded me was I kept derived 3D6 stats because to me that is so essential to the experience of D&D &D <laughs> and the memories I have of it. 3D6 down the yeah, line! Yeah, exactly. Go get Bob World Builder shirt. <laughs> yes, Rooney Hour designed this. This is Bob World Builder shirt. I had to have it because I agree. I think that it's so baked in to our experience of D&D &D and I wanted to have the nostalgia. I wanted to have a connection to D&D &D in this game. Right. It was pretty overt. So... Um, and a few things like that stayed in Shadow Dark because of not the game itself, but the meta of the game, the experience of the game. It, I wanted it to align. Right. So, yeah, stuff like that. I don't know. Okay. What else should, like, what else should we dissect? <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, yeah. I guess, like, thinking about it like this, like, what, what was your, did you have, like, a process that you want to talk about more clearly, like, for somebody who is they have their own home game they mm -hmm. and maybe shadow dark isn't the thing that they want to play mm -hmm. which is obviously entirely possible mm -hmm. what would you say is the is a you know retrospectively looking back what did your process contribute to the creation of shadow dark and now that shadow dark is complete did anything find its way into initial drafts of shadow dark that you realize now if you had done more work at the beginning mm -hmm. like what you could have stopped from getting into initial drafts oh yeah because we the, i went down some design rabbit holes with it that ended up getting tested out of the game um <clears throat> i mean the most obvious one being a skill system i had a skill system in shadow dark oh, wow i did and i i fought with it for so long and i was like it's not working it's not it's it's I had it because I thought I needed it to be adjacent to Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And then I just was like, but <laughs> we didn't have skill systems way back in the day, pre 2E. And, and I, you know, I had to remind myself that that worked back then. That worked right. very well. And so a little bit of faith there and removing that system because it didn't, it didn't play well at the table. And that's the biggest thing, kind of going back to the first part of your question, I think that if you want to sit down and, and start to design your own game, it has to come from at the table experience. So, so I think, so I think I, you need to be playing different kinds of games, multiple game styles, um, and taking note of what's out there and trying it so that you can discover what you do and don't like, like discovering points of friction or, or issues is actually really important. Like things that you don't like about the system you're playing helps you design something in a way that you do like. And we were talking about this the other day yeah. where you, it's almost like you, you examining the systems that are close to what you want to do um, helps you lift out things that you might want to change. And that really was kind of the core of where I got started with Shadow Dark. I realized I wanted to make too many changes. <laughs> and 
So of course it's a blend of what you like, but knowing what you don't want in your game is as essential. Right. Yeah. And then as you're doing that process, you're, you're making a list of things that you do and don't want. You have to try to distill what you want down into some pillars, like some core pillars. And I ended up sharing that in the Shadow Dark book, the core ethos page of the book, um, which was the design pillars that I was writing the game around. And just just for the viewers, what mm-hmm. what exactly do you mean by pillars if you don't have the book in front of you? Yes. So like what what are the, what are these pillars? Yes, they're they're <laughs> so they're they're kind of high concept items that are gonna do, like like you know, have a waterfall effect down into the way that you design systems. They're not systems, they're ideas. So one of the examples of this is darkness must matter. That was Mm, one of the core pillars of shadow dark design. Time must matter. So before you even get down to designing the mechanics, like you have to identify what you want the mechanics to actually reflect. Because if you're just making mechanics for the sake of it, it's just sort of an exercise in what you can do, not what you should do. Um, and that, so that, that, like making a list of like, I really want darkness to matter. I really want, for example, one could say, I really want tactical combat to matter. I really want right. movement to matter. I really want, um, you know, role playing to matter as broad as that is. And then you can okay. move in the direction of those goals and you don't want too big of a list, but you want one that's, that covers kind of all the broad aspects of what you think you might be designing. Okay. Mm-hmm. What? Did you have any of these ethos that changed over time or that were like in con, like you recognized that some were in conflict with each other? Yes. They, I recognize that some of them were in conflict with each other because I was designing away from them in, in ways like wanting to insert a skill system. I, I was, when I was doing that, I was actually like moving away from some of my core ethos around wanting player freedom to, to be super important. And so it's like, it helped me realize that, like knowing the design pillar I wanted that I was actually working against. And I had to really step back and be like, why am I, why am I trying to design a skill system into here? Is it because I'm afraid people won't take the game seriously if it doesn't have one? Are people going to call it too arbitrary if I don't have one? And I I had to really examine that and I ended up stripping a few things out that conflicted with those pillars. What, What did you remove besides the skill system? I also removed a lot of, this is a silly one, but a lot of inventory that was unnecessary. Like, <laughs> like yeah, classic gear that was on the D&D list of, of, of essential gear. I, I, one of the things was that gear must matter. That was one of the pieces of core ethos I had. And I was designing a bunch of gear that didn't have any purpose, like hammers. <laughs> like hammers. Why was that intentional to remove hammers? Yes, okay. they, hammers were in an early draft of Shadow Dark, and they oh my ended gosh. up. It, it turns out that iron spikes and pitons are very useful to adventurers and very great for like problem solving and things like that. But how um, do you hammer them in? I know. Well, you. I had to abstract that. I ended up abstracting it because what happened was inventory is so limited. Your gear slots are so limited in Shadow Dark oh, that they that's each funny. matter. Yeah, and then a hammer was a useless piece of gear that you had to use to make an actually useful piece of gear matter. Mm. And so it was dead weight. And That's interesting. You know, I never noticed that. Like, I've even played Shadow Dark now where players have pulled out iron spikes and they say they put it in a, a rock joint or, you know, a mortar line. Yeah. And I never even was like, okay, what are you using to hammer it in? It's never even... It, I, I never even thought about it. I know, because you can come up with... I mean, I know it is... And it, this is an example of an abstraction that does... Jo- like, gra- like, it doesn't go with reality's demands as well. But identifying places where you can abstract out... Um, simulationism or like making it seem like the real world for the sake of a better play experience those are like the fussy things you do when you're playing your game at the table and you're building dozens of characters to play test the process um so yeah i'm just like well you probably just use the back of another iron spike to hammer that one in or like the pommel of your long sword i mean i don't know like come up with something use a rock so yeah, use a rock yeah. exactly and that is why hammers were removed <laughs> i see everyone saying never forget 11, 12, 21, the day hammers were removed from the beta draft. <laughs> That's, um, I love that you have fans that remember when this was removed. I didn't even know this was a thing. It's Doc. Doc is the mod in our Discord server. He's one of the two mods, and he um, he remembers that day well. That's so funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So. So, chat. 
do you have any questions about Shadow Dark or just game design in general yeah. that you want to pose to us? Um, it looks like we have probably like a 30 second lag or so. I know. Um, so we'll, we'll just continue to, to riff about Shadow Dark or game design. I guess uh, you know, what RPG, while we're waiting on this, this is something that I think is really curious. What RPGs that are not D&D are your favorite? Like not D&D related at all. No at all. OSR. No TSR, no WotC, like, no nothing. It can't have skeletons in it. It can't have skeletons That's in it. That's the barometer yeah, for is it d exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, so I can't say the skeletons, actually, which I really love. It's a fun game. But um, I, I like, I really like Dread. And I know that's an Ooh, old, that's an old, okay. it's a deep cut. But yeah. because that's the, that's the first game I played where there was like a really visible meta currency, mm -hmm. the Jenga Tower. And it opened up this entire realm of like, oh my God, I, I suddenly realized that we are not our characters. We are the audience to our characters. And Ooh, that's such a good way to say that. Yeah. You're the audience to our characters. Yeah, and, and that you can play with the emotions and experience of the players on a separate plane from that of the characters. And that that revelation eventually led to the torch timer in Shadow Dark. So, yeah. Okay, oh, 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 hold on, hold on. Okay, so... If we're talking about the metagame, like, relationship of players at the table and, like, one player just decides they're going to be a jackass and make a check in Dread that they know they shouldn't be making because they're, like, two bricks away from the tower mm -hmm. clearly going to fall. Mm -hmm. How does that translate to... Is it because... You know, how, how, did, how do you go from that to the, the hour base torch mechanic? Well, because I guess both the interesting thing about a meta currency is that the players can influence it like for bad reasons, mm, you know, okay. they can mess with it. And it's like, if you want to try to knock the tower over in dread, everyone else who's playing is like, no, no, no. And you're engaging with the game in sort of a weird way, in right. sort of a fun way. And that's true with the torch timer too. Like someone can purposefully waste time and run the torch timer down. And that might actually even in introduce an interesting level of like antagonism that someone could subtly do like if I they're an never enemy realize that this is a possibility yeah. i don't know why <laughs> but it's never come up in my games i don't think I've, i i think i have had someone intentionally run down the timer for like antagonistic reasons that were kind of funny and at a con That's game so but good. but like if you're playing the character because you know the classic like i'm actually playing a character that for the next six sessions you guys don't realize is a doppelganger or something right you can antagonize the players oh, that's so good and it's almost like the a werewolf level of like i'm gonna try to hide oh. the fact that i am abusing the meta currency and see how long i can get away with it right so i think that's so fun oh I hope, that's yeah. so good okay so besides dread do you have any other standout favorites Hmm. I, oh man, I, I played so much D and D and D and D adjacent stuff as a kid that it's definitely my bread and butter. I used to play the Dragon Ball Z, um, role-playing game that came out like there was 15 a, years ago. Oh, was this awful. D20 based? No, it no? was like, I think it was a dice pool system. Okay. Usually um, those kinds of games are. Yeah, and it kind of like, it kind of like soured me on dice pool systems because it was so easy to just ridiculously break the game in like one session i was okay, like that's I was weird of like you know like a first level z warrior and i was like oh i already i already figured out a way to make a kamehameha that can blow up the moon and oh, okay. yeah so it was but west end star wars doesn't redeem it i didn't play a ton of that oh and we played gosh. a little bit of We're it We're done i'm I leaving know. your house now <laughs> <laughs> i know what am i one of my friends actually worked on designing, I believe it was like the third edition version, like the D20 version of Star Wars, or was it? Oh, it, yeah, there was, it was a D20 third yeah. edition and, version. It and was I did awful. play it. <laughs> it was awful. I owned I it. It was it bad. Twice. Do not get it. <laughs> I think it had a lot of, it suffered from third edition's bonus creep problems. Yes, you know? absolutely. But at least you could be like, well, I am a first level Jedi who can lift an X Wing, you know? So. Okay. It was so fun. <laughs> so fun. What about, okay, so you have played. A vast array of games, and you sort of. <laughs> well, you have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There, there. Okay, I own a lot of dust collectors, and mm -hmm. I got tired of them being dust collectors. And I had a group that, like, in between longer campaigns, mm -hmm. we just spent like a year doing like one shots or mm -hmm. two shots mm -hmm. in all the systems that I actually wanted to try, oh. and learned really. I think it was more of an experience of learning how to read the rules 
because I perceived the rules as good, but would the gameplay at the table represent what I initially thought of the rules on a cold read? And it made me far better at analyzing rules after that experience to just do a year of one shots, basically. Interesting. Do you remember any specific really crazy revelations where you're like, this seemed awesome and it totally sucked, or vice versa? Yeah, GURPS. Oh. I thought GURPS was going to be awesome. <laughs> Isn't that like the age old internet? Like, but what about GURPS? Yeah, you know, yeah. like you everywhere. Know, like, I thought GURPS was going to be awesome, and it was the most time consuming, table heavy. Mm. Like, it was it was worse than a role master. Mm. I, I, could, I can't even begin to describe. Like, not only that, but like it seemed as if in GURPS, and it didn't initially jump out to me. It seemed as if that there were two different versions of resolving issues in the game that were like, okay, so what happens if you're making a perception check and I'm making a stealth check and we both succeed? Like, oh, <laughs> like, yeah, that's like, bad. It was really weird. Like, that was just not... It, it, for me, at least, it did not jump out at me in the rules. Of course, this was like a decade ago. Right. So, you know, that, that, GURPS was probably the most gut-wrenching standout of... I thought it was going to be awesome. It absolutely was not. What a bummer. But yeah. this, this just, I guess it illustrates the importance of like, like designing from, as a result of, of play. Yeah. Like, no, absolutely. That's even how I write adventures. Like half the reason I changed the, like the format that I write fifth mm -hmm. edition adventures in com arose completely out of my inability to sit down and read like a second edition style info dump style adventure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I was just like, I either have to quit playing D&D &D or I have to do something about this. And you know what I chose. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I, another one that jumps out at me was I, I actually found Western Star Wars in a really backwards way. Mm -hmm. My friends were really into Mass Effect. Oh. And there is a like unofficial D6 pool style like built on top of the West End Games engine oh. version of Mass Effect the RPG basically. Okay. So I just found that and started like playing through it and I was like okay this looks all right, we'll play it. And we had a blast playing, like, you know, a, some sort of covert mission type of thing. Um, and, like, that was that was awesome. But then, like, I went back and started reading the Star Wars RPG. And I was like, why? This just feels like the, the force effects feel really clunky. The combat felt really clunky when I was reading it. Hmm. And then we sat down to play... And it took us about two rounds of getting through the initiative to uh, like one or two rounds of combat to really get our heads around what was going on because it was pretty different to have like this, like you had initiative within initiative mm -hmm. in West End D6, okay. which was really interesting. Everybody took an action and then you could declare that you wanted to take more actions at the beginning, beginning of the combat round for a penalty. Oh. So, and it just seemed so clunky and weird to me. But we realized all you had to do was put a big old, you know, D6 die. Like, that's how many actions I have left this combat turn. Oh. And it made, like, you know, on, on a D&D &D scale, it doesn't really make sense. But, like, you could hypothetically say, I want to take 12 actions and just blast the crap out of the Stormtrooper. The Stormtrooper's only got enough dice pool potential to shoot back at you once. And you're just going to unload an entire blaster clip into him and getting through two rounds of combat showed me just how elegant you can make a tactical combat game and still keep the game moving lightning fast because every character only has one action within that round of initiative before it comes back to their initiative again where they can take their future actions ah. so like it it really it did it does this really uh interesting thing of threading the needle between you know, typically uh, like a more modern or contemporary OSR game, especially like um, index card RPG, you get a move and an action and that's all you get. Mm -hmm. Or like Pathfinder, where you have a bonus action, a swift action, a free action, an action, and double action. A move. Like how many freaking, you know, I'm being pedantic <laughs> here, but like how many things do you do on your turn? Meanwhile, the rest of the table is snoring. Yeah. West ND6 just is like, yeah, do whatever the heck you want, but you're only allowed to do one part of it on your turn before it comes back around to you. 
Absolutely fantastic stuff. Super interesting. That that's actually I would love to look back into that. And yeah, we should play that. West End Star Wars. Yeah, we should. <laughs> I want to play it. Let's play yeah, it. Yeah. Let's get Alex in on it. I know he okay. played it too. I I had seen someone in the chat ask a question that, I, and thank you for putting all capitals in it because I saw it. It jumped out. Um, but someone asked about the the drop the die drop tables in Shattered Art for creating dungeons and how it's limited to like five to ten rooms or so. And that is correct, but if you want to make a larger dungeon, just treat each part of the dungeon as a separate node that recycles the die drop method. Oh, that, yeah, that's fun. Yeah, just do that. Just use it again. Make a bigger dungeon and stick them together. <laughs> yeah, one, one of the, my greatest hacks when I want to make a larger dungeon is make a five, five room dungeon. Oh, yeah. Make five, five room dungeons and smash them together. That would be really interesting because yeah. that actually would be because it's, it's like... The five room dungeon, I think, is a very like fifth edition oriented design style, and mm -hmm. I, I don't think it works very well for um, old school games. But if you blend a bunch of them into a larger space, it requires some exploration and mm -hmm. taps into the mechanics that draw out um, resources through exploration. Then that would be really interesting and yeah. cool, and each themed in its own way. Yeah, and yeah. not just that, but like interconnected themes in another way. Yeah, like something that gets really damn noodly that I thought about doing was like if each dungeon also represents in its totality kind of the meta conception of each of one room yes. in a five room dungeon. Yeah, so like this so is the, like, the you know, climactic battle yeah, within yeah, yeah, yeah. the, yeah, that yeah, would, yeah, yeah. you should totally do that. Yeah. Would it well, be possible? I've, I've got maps of one dungeon that I've done this with. Yeah. I just need, I, it, I just am frustrated with myself and need to publish it. Just Basically, publish it. I know, I need to make stuff. I know, sometimes it's <laughs> scary to publish something that's conceptual. Like I've definitely put some work out there where I'm like, I was trying something new and weird in this and I'm not sure if anyone's going to notice and if they do, they might hate it. So it's like a little bit right. scary. It's, it's easy to stick to the formulas that you know work. <coughs> and in fact, you probably should, like, if you have a formula that works, definitely use it repeatedly. But mm -hmm. yeah, it can be kind of scary to put something out there that's conceptual. It's more like, I'd have to actually write it. Like I have to put, because right now it's just like scrawl on notebook paper mm -hmm. and taking it to a polished enough state to, you know, be able to sell it for four ninety nine. You can do it. You can <laughs> do just, it. You did the hard part already yeah. if it's conceptual. I guess so. Is there, I saw a question where someone said, did you consider roll under when designing Shattered Arc? And that is the reason why I did not choose Black Hack as my um, game really? of choice. I, okay. I think the roll under, I, the, for me it was, a, again, a, a core pillar that we needed a unified system. Um, because we needed roll high to always be better in Shadow Dark. Hmm. And that is true throughout the entire game, including game master facing roles. So um, I couldn't I couldn't do roll under because I think it flies in the face of like, well, this is the one exception to that rule and it's a very big exception. And so I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't bring myself to do it. <laughs> That's funny. And I just like rolling high. I, I, I guess like I grew up in the post 2E, like the... the I played second edition and then third edition came and steamrolled it um, a few years after I started playing and rolling a natural 20 on a d20 is so ingrained in D&D &D and D&D &D adjacent players that like I cannot have a 20 be a failure, you know, at least in, at least in my own work. It, it can work in other games and it does. It works in Black Hack. It works in Crown of Skull actually. It's like... Other games do leverage that well, but I they didn't work with Shadow Dark's philosophy of having everything be aimed at roll high so we could have a unified mechanic for simplicity's sake. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions in the chat? <laughs> so we're having to like read my laptop from all the way over here, and it's really far away. I know. So maybe so we, I wish we could have just dragged it closer, but then it'd be in the in the video. I know. It says, please answer the question from Mika Brush, but it scrolled past me before I could catch it. So please ask it again. Please ask. Where's my um, phone? I'm yeah. going to grab my phone. Okay. Okay. He's grabbing the phone. Actually scroll the images. Or sc the images. Scroll the, uh, yeah. let's see. I'm seeing a question of, um, are you considering revamping any of your previous work? Um, you oh, like know, porting your 5e work over yeah, to Shadow Dark? That'd be cool. It would be. I've, I've had people very kindly ask me about that. And I designed it using 5th edition design um, ethos. And I, I, don't, I don't think it would port well to Shadow Dark. Genuinely. And, and, and that's, not a, that's not a dig on 5th edition. I love designing for 5th edition. So I just think that when I was designing that material for 5th edition, I was using a methodology that was trying to leverage what fifth edition does best and 
that's not necessarily what Shattered Art does best. So it, it could fall flat, you know? Um, and the other part of it too is I almost... I almost feel like I would rather make new stuff for Shadow Dark than to retread stuff that I made that wouldn't really be an idealized output for the game. You know, like I'd rather make a new adventure that was that was for Shadow Dark than try to convert five that were not for it and landed a bit mediocre mm -hmm. because of that. You know, so yeah, that was. Um, Jeff says looks like he's playing question curator role. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have. From the DM's craft, is your game design more intellectual or more just gut feeling? Ooh, it's totally gut feeling at first because it has to pass a smell check at the table. Okay. You know, like it, it, like whatever the mechanic is, if it doesn't feel like it works in actual table play, then I get, then I just it's not working. You know, and so intellectually, I don't think that Shadow Dark has any what I would call like virtuoso design. There's nothing that's so intellectually like a moonshot that it that it's like groundbreaking so I, I think that right. really it is much more of a gut vibe type game that's interesting yeah i do think that torch stuff was was yeah i was gonna say the torch stuff seemed really novel yeah like everyone's tying like, it to an actual clock i know and yeah. it, surely i'm not the first person i know i'm not the first person probably to make a real-time mechanic in games but i i was kind of developing this game in a vacuum too at a certain point and like the 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 torch timer thing I hadn't seen anywhere else and it, it's it solved a problem that I had and it really came from my understanding of other games that have meta currencies but I had never seen one like that so that's and also from being a teacher and timing students to get them to act more quickly and stop wasting the dang time during class that that's literally part, <laughs> partly where it came from that's too. funny yeah but oh is there okay um I'm looking over at our screen you focused on making darkness core to the game where and how do you feel what that did will Wait, to scroll it up. Should I scroll it up? Yeah, what that did to city, wilderness, and other non dungeon crawl related stuff. What how do you feel that did about city? Oh, okay. Do I have to click this arrow? Yeah, you gotta scroll all the way to the bottom now. Or click the arrow. The way. There we go. Okay. You have inverted scrolling. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. Okay, so how did how does darkness impact the overland portion? Um, it really separates the mythic underworld from the overworld a lot. Um, and like the concept of the mythic underworld is this, this, this idea that when you enter a dungeon or any place that would be considered the shadow dark. So like a, essentially when you go into dungeon crawling rules, um, it is suddenly much more dangerous in the real world. And that, that's, to, that's, you're trying to create a little bit of a, a balance between the mundane and normal and the safe versus the dangerous and the unexpected and the nonsensical. And so I, Overland travel is still dangerous in Shadow Dark, and hex crawling is still really dangerous. But the the real timer in hex crawling is rations. Mm. Um, you're probably not going to be traveling at night unless you're foolish or desperate. Um, and there's still danger level is still present when you're doing overland travel, but it's a different style of gameplay that that I didn't want to be the same as dungeon crawling. So there aren't there, light mechanics aren't as prevalent in overland travel. Um, but you still can die from starvation very easily. So it's not like it's safe. Um, right. I hope I answered that question yeah. thoroughly. But they're very different modes of gameplay in the rules. But I think it is another thing I hear is that people are like, well, Shadow Dark is only about dungeon crawling. And it's, it's, it has the most robust rules around dungeon crawling. But I don't feel that role-playing rules need to be super robust. And I don't think that overland rules need to be super complicated if you have a hex crawling system. So... Whereas dungeon crawling needed more systematized complexity. So, yeah, you can still role play. Yeah, you can. <laughs> you can still have campaigns. You can still talk to people. You can still go out in the wilderness. Like, that's the same as in Basic Expert. The rules were pretty, uh, you know, they weren't super heavy handed. But people still did all that stuff. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm hmm. Do we have any other questions? How do you balance mechanics for a non-heroic fantasy system without it feeling like the game is punishing the players? Hmm, that's a good question. Instead of like, I think instead of focusing in, on how you you don't want to penalize the players for making good decisions, so you you have to give them the power to make good decisions. Like, I, I think that just by being non being heroic means that you're allowed to be a little bit more foolish in your actions. 
because you have a buffer, you have a safety buffer. Like I, oh, I, I can spend the points needed to get myself out of the situation. Oh, I have enough HP to absorb a few mistakes. So you reward players for being smart and you don't encourage them to be foolish. And so I'm not sure that like having a more dangerous system would be called more punishing. I think that it's a little bit more trusting in the players to play smart and then you reward that smart play. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Did I just contradict myself a little bit? I, I don't think, know. I think, yeah. it, I think you've threaded the needle there. Yeah. It's like fun. it's, it's, it's funny because you, you don't, I don't like making mechanics that are punitive. If you like look very carefully at the game, you'll see that a lot of stuff does not have a punitive downshot if you fail, for example, mm-hmm. um, except in a couple like minor cases. So try not to be arbitrarily punitive. Like, haha, you failed your attack roll, therefore you must make a fumble check. Like, no. Yeah. That kind of thing. Like, don't work that kind of stuff into the game and then trust that the people playing the game will play smart and then reward playing smart. So there was another good question that we scrolled past. I don't know, remember who asked it. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you know when something isn't working at the table and it's just not... How, like, what's the difference between knowing that it doesn't fit and it's not your... Per- and other Or that it's not your personal preference? Or, or like, are those two things the same? Some, often. Okay. They often are because I think if you're working on a system, you have to be writing it for yourself first and foremost because you have to like it. Like don't write stuff that you don't like because you think someone else does. The only the only real barometer you have is whether you like it. So you have to get you have to like work on building up your ability to detect what you do and don't like in games, which is why you have to play a lot of games and play games that you think suck so that you can discover why, you know, and and identify why and identify the feeling of at the table like I'm bored, I'm not enjoying this, my character feels powerless, my character feels like X, Y, Z, if, you, if you've never experienced that or you've, you've never played another game that gives you a different reflection on that, on that experience, you can't really identify what you don't like. So um, yeah, I lost the thread of where I was going, but <laughs> how, do you, how do you identify whether something's not working at the table or whether it's just that you don't like it? Those are the same thing. That's, that is a good point. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is another good question here. Um, what about this narrative that keeps popping up apparently? I've never seen it. Which is it? But House yeah. DM says that people say Shadow Dark doesn't work for long, long-term long styles of campaigns. Can you speak to that at all? I've been running the same group in it for years. They're fifth level. And yeah. I, I, at least in my experience, there's been absolutely no hindrance to running campaign style play. I, I think it's because people see that it cuts off at 10th level and they speculate that that means that the game is supposed to be shorter in duration Mm -hmm. or that um or possibly that the lethality of the game might might hinder campaign play but it's weird because um basic expert which is another close cousin of shadow dark was much more lethal than shadow dark oh for sure yet 100 percent. right and and yet we got amazing adventures like um, keep on the borderlands that inspired years of play for some people just that adventure alone in the caves of chaos enormous amount of gameplay potential just in that and characters were dying a lot more frequently back then so I, I think that you know to a certain extent people like to equate the lethality of the game with its inability to handle campaign play but history has kind of proven that to be not true and my own experience playtesting the game has allowed me to run very lengthy campaigns yeah. in it I, like, I remember I started a Shadow Dark campaign that was kind of on again, off again, but we played for almost a year and a half back before the full rules were even released. Oh, yeah. Because I bought a whole crap ton of Shadow Dark to give away as uh, wedding favors. That's how we met. My, yeah, that's how <laughs> yeah. we met. Uh, I, I was like, can you help me with wedding favors? I want to give away an RPG, and yours is the one to do it with. Um, <laughs> so cool. Yeah. But uh, it was a Conan the Barbarian themed wedding too. Oh. But uh, no, like ever since then, I had been playing a Shadow Dark campaign, and we've been playing for almost a year and a half, almost two, maybe close to two years. Mm-hmm. But it's been kind of on again, off again. Probably a year's worth of gameplay. Mm-hmm. Like you can absolutely do this. They're like sixth through eighth level. We've had some character deaths, so mm-hmm. it happens. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where that narrative comes from. I think 
it's because people want to have something to say that's a little bit like skeptical, which is fair. Like if someone's reviewing a game, they're like, could this be a problem? And it's worth speculating over, mm -hmm. but characters are meant to be able to reach 10th level in Shattered Art. Like they're meant to be able to do it. You know, based on a lot of data that I calculated out about the game that I built up through playtesting, it should take about a year of maybe once or every other week of play on average. Um, and I've never had a character naturally reach 10th level in one of my own games. Like anytime I was playtesting high level, we actually built high level characters. Hmm. So the highest character I've ever had in my own home games reached, I believe, seventh level. Um, and so, yeah, it's really weird. Like, it, it's, but you're meant to be able to achieve it, unlike achieving 20th level in fifth edition, which yeah, would be next to there. impossible. No, yeah. Nobody gets there. And the game breaks down well before that. Like, Shadow Dark is meant to not break down and to cleanly take you to 10th level. That's cool. Which I hope it does. <laughs> By the way, how much have we raised? I just so noticed that somebody anonymously donated $20 to develop oh. Africa. I think it's time we do a... Uh, a vibe check here. This oh, people are asking where the shirt's from too. As oh, yeah. Tom intended, this is Bob World Builder's amazing shirt, which was designed with help from Runehammer Games. So it's a combined effort. So go check out Bob's World Builder's channel. You can get it through his avenues, and I love it. Yeah, and go also check out uh, Runehammer's Mainframe podcast. It's really good stuff. He's putting he, them on YouTube now. Yeah, yeah, great stuff, man. So many. Commutes on the subway were rendered um, <laughs> palatable by that podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So 10th oh. level should be possible. Yeah, 10th level, level should. Yeah, everything should be possible if it's in the book. Can Oh, can we talk about the absence of saving throws and atta and, and Thaco, which I've called Thaco my whole <laughs> life? Um, uh, saving throws, um, for somebody who did not grow up in the BX, AD and D's, 2E sphere are completely incomprehensible. Like, why am I rolling Saber's Breath to dodge this trap? <laughs> like, Because it creates a burst of flame like a dragon's breath. But does it? I mean, not every time. <laughs> it's just like, I understand why those saves were built up through at-the-table play right. at, at you know Dave's and Gary's tables because those were the specific different types of threats they were commonly facing, and it was common enough that they decided to make saves specific to them. But in, in Shadow Dark, it's not broad enough anymore to cover... You know, like it is conceptually so much easier, in my opinion, especially for an inexperienced player to understand that dexterity is the agility dodge type check. And so the, the five saves are there in spirit, but not in name. They're tied again instead to the ability scores that they are most relevant to. And I think that's just a lot easier for people who aren't experienced with old school style play to understand. Also, just as an aside, what the heck is there a difference between spells and wands for saves in and old magic school? items? Uh, yeah, like, like, like why, why do I have two different saves for what should effectively be the same thing? I, and I, <laughs> I think that theoretically the reason was because like the enemy wizard was pointing their wand at you versus an, a, like a global spell effect affecting uh, you, and so they okay. had to hit you. But like it, it, it grew out of the fiction of D and D at the table, but it, it doesn't. It just doesn't make sense anymore. It's it's not a good umbrella thing, in, in my opinion. In my opinion, some people love them, especially because they're nostalgic, and I totally yeah. get that. I totally get it. There's, that's not wrong. Um, and Thacko, I don't. Could, it wouldn't have been useful because a lot of the the unified system in Shadow Dark was a D twenty, adding a derived bonus from a stat and to make combat rolls work differently simply for the reason of having Thacko would have been in defiance of that ethos that I've set up. So everything is based on a D20 plus ability score modifier, stat modifier. Um, and I just don't like Thacko. <laughs> I just don't like it. Wait. I'm sorry. It's, 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 some people love it. And it's, it, what it, it's good because you can be like, okay, I hit. But it right. still requires the, the dungeon master to tell you the armor class of the monster. So like I could also just tell you the armor class of the monster and a roll to hit, like a roll high. Right. I, yeah. I was talking to Professor Dungeon Master at Gen Con last year. We were eating breakfast together. And I don't remember exactly what uh, the professor said, but it was I was like, that's why Thaco exists. Because uh, like I'm make, I'm gonna make an assumption, so you acid test this for mm -hmm. me. Thaco existed because it was obviously arbitrarily confusing 
so that you could obfuscate some of the mechanics of hitting monsters from the players because they had to do this like reverse math nonsense or look at a table where it's like okay if they've got this armor class and i've got you know this thaco number and and so i subtract from 19 and you know like yeah. you, ha- you have to use a 40 ab- abacus in order to calculate what number you need to hit and like i i started playing second edition when i was in middle school and you know like it took me, like, I, obviously I didn't know what, what we were doing. Like, we were just playing at D&D. We weren't actually playing. Me too. But, like, it took probably six weeks of, like, uh, you know, like I was a smart kid. Yeah. It took six weeks of, like, reading and rereading until it finally clicked, like, what was actually going on in Thaco. Yeah. You know? So. I have, like, some theories that agree with that. Like, number okay. one, I think it might have been a little bit of, like, a gamer shibboleth where it's, like, can you figure this out? Mm, Do okay. you get it? Like, can you get it? And, like, if you can, you know, if, if you can roll, then, like, if you understand how this works, then we'll let you in the door. Oh, like, that's interesting. So it's, like, a gatekeeping mechanic? Possibly a little bit. But the other thing, too, is, like, I mean, Thaco does allow for armor classes, ar- like armor classes that are essentially unhittable by low-level characters, unless you want to have a natural twenty be an automatic hit. Which I can't remember if and when that got implemented. I don't know if that was the case in think, old. I don't think it was in, in second OD&D. edition. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember. So if anyone in the chat remembers when a nat twenty resulted in an auto hit, let me know. Um, but but. You like a dragon's armor class was simply unhittable by low level characters, and that's not necessarily true in other D and D based systems that came out after. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that was also part of it. Like you literally, you literally are stopped at the door. You cannot attack this dragon. There's no way you could hit it. Hmm. And so that might have been part of it. Maybe. Yeah. I mean. Of course, you could just do that by removing critical hits and hitting over the armor class. Yeah. Yeah, and like, I mean, even 5th edition wasn't brave enough to make something unhittable. Like, if you want to fight a... <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like of course, an ancient red dragon has a preposterous armor class, but they made... Was it like 36 or something? Uh, I don't know. No, well, in 3rd edition, it was like, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But it's like really high. But, 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 I mean, I think that any character... Is it like 24? Yeah, it's 24. So, like, but a character could hit that. Yes. Not that they would try to, but the way the 5th edition addressed that is by creating lesser like infants like you know like immature dragons like young dragons and stuff so that <clears throat> you could still fight dragons mm-hmm. yeah but in old school D, it was like no you can't hit that dragon so i don't know that was a long thaco dive yeah i just don't like it i don't like having to reference a chart to know if you hit yeah that's and silly. i don't like referencing charts at all in general like a lot of like shadow dark stuff was designed so that at least the players never have to reference a chart to know whether something was successful. Except for the mishap table, but that's always fun. Yes, exactly. That's <laughs> it's like, oh, thing. you critically failed the spell cast. Yeah. Now I got to find out what happens to you. And it's so <laughs> rare that you actually get to pull it off because, like, the the luck subsystem in Shattered Dark is really meant to help spellcasters, in particular, avoid mishaps. And it, like, I rarely, we rarely see a mishap actually happen. Because of the luck subsystem. So right. I like a lot of people are like, this is a flaw in Shadow Dark because you have a 1% chance of totally killing yourself each time you cast a spell. And that's only true if the entire group has no luck tokens. So probably, is, is that actually going to it's happen? It's not. It's very yeah. rare. It's very rare. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Professor just said, I was here. I was there for Thaco. There is no defense for it. Needlessly <laughs> complex. <laughs> there it is. We're vindicated, right? Yeah. I would love to hear people theorizing about why it exists. Referencing charts was like a thing you had to do when you were wargaming. So I think maybe they were just like, it just has to be this way. Yeah. You of know? course, I'm even seeing like, okay, so, you know, nerd alert here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also like read a lot of historical war games because I don't have friends that are interested in playing them. Um, but I would, I love like the idea of just pulling out some two millimeter Napoleonic figures. That just sounds oh, so fun. Oh, that would be fun. But like even even in those games, modern uh, historicals, mm-hmm. they're starting to get away from mechanics that require charts. Like it's all straight dice at the table. Yes, you have to to build out your army. You have to use charts. But once you get playing, the idea is that you should not have more than a sheet of paper to track everything at, at the table. So mm-hmm. anyway. I see someone saying that that goes a simplified class-specific attack table from 1E. 
It is just a number line from negative 10 to 10. Yes, it eliminates the chart. It, I mean, PDM is wrong. PDM is wrong. <laughs> it, I mean, if you memorize, yeah, you can, you can memorize. Or the thing is, most character sheets, even from AD and D, still have a channel for which you write your Thaco and whether you can hit, which tells me that it is still a chart reference mm. mentality, whether or not you've actually memorized it. And I, I think that you could, yeah. And it still requires the game master to tell you the armor class. If yeah. you want to know whether or not you hit, you will not know until the game master tells you. And that's true whether you're using Thacker or whether you're using roll to hit with a bonus. So, yeah, that's just my take on it. But um, someone else is saying there wasn't a... Um, uh, D&D wasn't designed until 3E. I don't agree with that. I don't think that's true. Yeah, because if it were just a bunch of house rules, we would have gotten Blackmore on Chainmail. Right. Like Moldvay took D and D and ran it through an incredibly intense design cleanup. Yeah. So like, I, I agree that the D and D derived out of a lot of house rules, first and foremost. But mm -hmm. it did go through legitimate design iterations, even even earlier than AD and D during BX. Yeah. Like I yeah. And just to that end, like I own a physical copy. Thank you very much, Christy, my wife, mm -hmm. bought me for Christmas a physical copy of original Dungeons and Dragons white box set, like one of the first 9,000 printed. And I went through it, probably should have been wearing white gloves, but I went through it and like, it is laughably, terribly laid out and designed. It's clear that that was just the house rules compiled into something that was mostly readable. So to say that that wasn't really designed, that, that that's a... That's I mean, a rough take. The, the the art of game design has grown over the last five decades. Yeah. Surely. And like there's some agreed upon principles that almost everybody agrees are true now. Um, so I think it was flailingly designed. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, improved in iteration. So, but yeah, but no, it was designed. It was yeah, especially yeah, sure. Gary taking Dave's like Blackmore notes and turning it into something semi-usable. Mm-hmm. Although I would still not say that OGD I mean, was usable, but like... Man, is it rough. It was not... Wow. I, like, yeah. I expected, on my first read-through, I expected to be able to, like, understand... Like, I tried to think about it. Like, what was it like to be a new player and sit down with this box set that I just bought at my local war games store for $10, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what it costs. That's a lot not of money 10, back then. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's about $55 in today's money. Mm. So, you know... How can I actually play this game? And man, it's hard to do. Something I kind of want to do is like, you know, mimic Ben Milton from Questing Beast and just say, Welcome back to Dungeon Masterpiece. I'm Baron. Today we're doing a review of the original Dungeons and Dragons. It's just, <laughs> and just the top down <laughs> camera on the butcher block table. And then it's like the. Wait, you have to make sure you have a gold wedding ring. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah I'll take my signet ring off. The only thing I knew about Ben after like watching his like page two videos is I was like, he's married. Because it's yeah. the only thing I knew. Because it's just his hands, you know. <laughs> Bless you, Ben. Um, oh, that's funny. I saw some good questions in here. Gosh, I wish I would not miss them. Someone asked, like, are you afraid? What, what do you do if you feel like other games are so good that you can't design something because it wouldn't be that good? It's I totally empathize because I think some games are so 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 good that it took me a long time to get over the fact that I thought I was contributing like not something worthy you know like, yeah, okay I have a strong philosophical statement to make about this or an inspirational statement to make about this yes mm -hmm. you may not be able to make the game that is that good now but you will never learn how to make a good make a good game or make a comparable game or make a game that is better than that game if you don't start now. Like the game that you make will be bad and that's okay. Just make stuff. Like rather than being a consumer, be a creator, make the thing. Mm -hmm. Just just go and make the thing. And it's okay if it's bad. It will be a relic of its time. And, you know, you might think to yourself, oh, it takes so long to make a game. And sure, that's true on a, on a certain scale. And I'm not trying to, like, get super into, like, my own personal family life here. But it just this is something that really resonated with me that my step-grandmother said to me once at a dinner table that profoundly reshaped how I think about how long things take. 
and you know, I was like 32, 33 at the time saying that, you know, I was dating some women. This is when I wasn't married. I was dating some women. I'm not sure if I wanted kids, you know, it's just so much a time investment and so on. And my step grandmother, who is, I think she just turned 80 this year. She said to me, Oh, but chill, your children are only in your life for such a short amount of time. And then they move away and you may not even see them very much anymore. And I was like, oh my God, she's right. But like I started thinking about it and, you know, I've got a lot of family all over the world and, you know, it suddenly switched gears in my mind of I'm only going, like if I keep on the trajectory of visiting my aunt, I might only see her maybe 15 more times before she passes away, which is no. a really morbid way to think about it no. because life, life ends. But in, in that, in that time period, like how much time do we have before you're 80 years old and you die? Right. That's true. <laughs> like, That's you, true. We're all going to be playing D and D for another 50 freaking years. Yeah. Go make the game. Yes. <laughs> you yes. know, you, I don't know who you are or how old you are in this, in this, in this virtual setup that we're all here in right now, but no, like you, you, we will be playing D and D for longer than I've been alive already, and I'm almost 40. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like... Almost 40 club. <laughs> <laughs> I, agree. I agree. I agree so, so much. And I, I could add, uh, like, some small bits of my own philosophy onto that right. very insightful thing, which is that time's going to pass anyway. So what are you going to do with it? Also, the first draft of Shadow Dark sucked. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was awful. Like, the only way that you get something to be good is to keep working at it. And... and Best is also subjective. So the best game for someone else is not the best game for me. If you write a game that is for you and you like every bit of it and it meets, meets all of your needs and goals, then it's your best game. So, that, so don't think that you wouldn't contribute something because as long as you like it, someone else is going to like it. And that's worth doing then. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there is also like, this is something that I've talked about with my uh, Patreon fans in Discord. Um, that there's also just a critical mass of stuff that you need to make before, like, you really start to find your voice and find what, how to be creative. Like, it's something that you just have to teach yourself to do. And also on, in that same light, like, if you're sharing your content that you're making, there's also a critical mass of stuff that you have to have before either the algorithms or people in general just organically stumble upon your stuff and like those two things, like you have to have a codified sense of what your own personal design philosophy truly looks like. And you have to have to have enough of that created for people to really start finding it and vibing with it mm -hmm. where they start sharing it out. And it may be, you know, two, three years of you making small adventures and getting one, two, three downloads or something like that. And then all of a sudden, somebody in you know the in an rpg review society decides to pick they just bump into your game mm -hmm. or bump into your adventure and find it and it's the one thing that takes off because they said something good about it or maybe they said something disparaging about it and everybody wants to go find out why it is and then they all disagree with this person right like any number of things could happen but you have to have that body of work created before that can happen mm -hmm. so you know just just keep making stuff yes. <laughs> just make yeah. stuff and also don't and look back it. yeah yeah don't look back like you do your best in the moment on the thing you're working on it might be that in five years you look back and you're like oh you know i'm i'm better now like ooh, i would have changed this or that about it but like don't look back on that you did the best you could in the moment you learned something from it why go around and around about it. Like yeah. the first adventure I ever published, like when I go back and look at it, I'm like, huh, I would have done this and that a little differently this time. But like, it's still, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. D write a better adventure next time then, you know? So yeah, we just got really philosophical. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It, yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do too. There's the time you would spend worrying about whether someone would like something, you should spend making things. Mm -hmm. Yep, and and don't design for other people. Just design the thing that you're passionate about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and other people will find the passion in the thing that you made. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Oh, JP Kuvert is here. Hey, buddy. He says, in my experience, making the thing is more fun than selling it, which is also cool. I, can, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. The, the joy of creating kind of comes from that state where you're, it's like from the, a flow state, you know, where yeah. you're, you're working on something that you care about and you're like making it happen and time is passing. And that's the best part about creating things, I think. Selling it is nice. <laughs> I mean, and selling puts food on the table. It does. That's a cool thing. <laughs> and having the end goal of sharing something out will help push you towards that goal. But it's, it's really true that the, the, the joy is in the work. And if what you're doing isn't fun, then you should try to change tacts a little bit because you should try to be having fun for most of it. Some of it's grindy. It's always going to be the case. But most of the time, you should be enjoying what you're doing. I hope. Yeah, I mean, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take a quick break real quick here and point out that we have raised $259. I saw a whole slew of like donations whiz by in the comments. So thank you all to every, everybody who donated. Thank like, you. That's awesome. Yes. And I was like, yeah, we'll do $100. So I guess I have to do a feat of strength. Two feats of strength. I don't know what these What are. would it be? I have no idea. I, I have a feeling if I budge this webcam... Like it's been on the fritz ever while we were setting this up. So should we'll we, do it at the very should end. Should we arm wrestle? Like, <laughs> 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 Am I allowed to use both hands and you're only yes. allowed to use one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And An arm wrestling match the wall. where I <laughs> promise not to throw you through the fireplace. <laughs> uh, that would be funny. I, I think you can you you can squat three of me now is what it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, my one rep max squat is to squat three of your body weight. Yeah, so <laughs> that alone is a feat of strength right there. Yeah. I don't know what it'll we'll have to do something at the end. Or so something. go go Google this. This conversation came about because uh, one of my patrons sent me the Meatheads RPG where your only stat is strength. So go check that out. <laughs> Google it or something. I don't know. <laughs> That's, well, the Meatheads RPG. Yeah. We were talking. What were we talking about with Jesse? Where um, we wanted to make the an RPG about like going into dive bars and the only stat was vibe and you everything you did was based off making a vibe check. Yes. <laughs> vibe check. Make a vibe check. Did you pass? All right. All right. That's you can so actually funny. get your beer at the bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you fail, like maybe it's like a like a, a no butt system or like a no and system. I don't know yeah. something. But I don't know. If you fail the vibe check, then that means some jerk comes up to you and starts cursing you out for like thinking that you were talking to his girlfriend. I don't know. I don't know. But that's that was based on the fact that Jesse tries to like tries to like hang by like throwing out silly made up D and D speak. And she knows it's hysterical and she'll get to the point where she starts calling for checks and she doesn't know what the stats are. So she'll say, make a vibe check. <laughs> so good. Oh man. All right. What have we got? Oh. Do we, yeah. Do we have any? Sursa's here. Hey, Sursa. Hi, Sursa. How's oh, it going? Oh my gosh. We have such cool people. Look at all the cool people in the chat here. I saw a uh, bill from Wylock's Armory. Wylock. From Wylock's Armory. Wylock! Oh, coming through here. It's getting, that's Yeah. And he's met. close yeah. to finishing his cyberpunk RPG, Neon Skies. So oh. go subscribe to his channel so you get a push notification when that comes out. Oh, that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. What what else? Oh, a question. What are your opinions on rolling damage without the need to roll to hit? Um It's my favorite. Yeah. You <laughs> love it. You love, I love it. I love it. I'll never go back. I know, and I totally res I totally like it in the games that it's designed for. It it speeds up, it speeds up combat. Yep. Um I liked rolling to hit because again that that goes back to the nostalgia of like the D and D experience for me, um, where like rolling a critical hit in a dire moment is kind of a very triumphant thing. Um, so at least in Shadow Dark, I mean, I decided to include rolls to hit in Shadow Dark not for just that reason, but it was one of the reasons. But like, there are a lot of games that have auto damage that are that are really slick. Like, oh, yeah. really slick. And, like, I know... The um, whole Into the Odd ecosystem. Yeah. Like, and my favorite among those, like, Into the Odd is awesome, but it's also a weird, zany game. Mm -hmm. So, like, don't spring that first on, like, new players because they're going to be like, what the heck are we actually playing here? But yeah. Mouse Ritter and Cairn do that very well. Yeah. And I yeah. know Runehammer is adopting that for Crown and Skull. Yes, That's in did. Crown and Skull, which is, yep. like, really cool. It's cool. Like, it, it's, it's absolutely an innovation that I think will stick in game design as, as sure. like a really useful solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Um, not a fan of new rules. That's okay. Yeah. Baron, you won't ever go back. Would you port it to Shadow Dark? I thought about it, but I think it'd break. No, everything. no. I'll still play Shadow Dark as written. 
but <laughs> no, but uh, you know, if like I'm, I've been talking with a few other. Uh, I, I learned that I used to call us D and D tubers. Yeah. But uh, I bumped into a video where somebody was ranking our thumbnails our, th our <laughs> video thumbnails on a tier list and i was like what the heck the people make the weirdest content i mean it's hilarious <laughs> i the thought it was really funny. it was yeah. so funny I know. uh but uh anyway the, the person in this video called us dungeon tubers which is such a better word it's so, a great yeah, word we are not dungeon tubers i love it but anyway why why did i bring that up i don't oh, know i've been talking to a few different dungeon tubers about a sci-fi game i'm making and it's definitely going to be in the roll just roll damage yeah soak for armor but we're yeah. we're blathering about that and i, I think it's, you've got some cool angles to try yeah it. yeah yeah i think it's gonna be cool Hopefully. I don't know. I love it. I keep, I, it, it's currently just in like deep shower thought mode. It's not on paper yet. I, I think what it needs to do is just start playing. I just need to play it. Yeah. So. Yeah, you're kind of at that point. Yeah. You're ready to start testing. I'm ready to start playing. playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. JP asked a question. He said, what adventure do you have in, adventures do you have in the works? Oh, I, um, I'm writing three more curse scroll zines, which are like supplemental zines for Shadow Dark. Um, and each is going to have an adventure in it. I'm not totally, I'm not at the point where I totally know what the adventures will be, but I know kind of the environment that they'll be. And one of them I'm really excited to write is kind of exploring like the whole hinted at jungle vampire thing going on in Shadow Dark, like Ob Ix and um, that, that named character in the book and then sort of her empire. It's still out there and it's in, it's in some dark jungle. And so I wanted to write an adventure um, about that cool thing in the world yeah um i saw oh my gosh scott's here hey scott oh my gosh steven's here steven i have to ask you about making sting bat plushies you know how to do it yeah you know how to do it i'm gonna ask you when i have a chance yep yeah steven from roll for combat's here and yes she does need sting bat plushies but also i will send you a link to that uh dungeon tuber thumbnail tier list yeah <laughs> Oh, uh, do you think spell levels will be the next sacred cow to potentially get the axe in the gaming sphere, like attack rolls? 100%. Spell levels should die. We should all be moving to glog spells. Stay tuned for my channel Stay when I release tuned. a fifth edition glog spell conversion oh that uses God. spell points. You can cast wish, wish at first level, and if you fail, it's going to be miserable for your character, but yes. you can do it. I, Actually, that's a lie, but... I think okay. that there needs to be, like, Vancey in spell casting, but slot base that has a really locked-in progression... Um, also like levels, just don't call two things in the game levels. That's super confusing. We know this now. So yeah. I can cast second level spells when I get to third level. Mm -hmm. I can cast third level spells when I get to fifth level. Yeah. Like think back when you first started playing D&D to all the things that confused you. Those are things that, that is powerful information to mine when you're writing your yeah. own game. Um, but I think, I think like for me, I, I love roll to cast because it removes a lockstep of spell. Like you could cat, you could try to cast like a fifth tier spell in Shadow Dark, even at first level. Generally, if you fail, that's very bad. Um, but yeah, spell levels are starting to kind of wash away a little bit. Yeah. 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 But yeah, if you're not familiar with the goblin laws of gaming, go check out that blog. That's where the glog spells are coming from. That's, that's where I was talking about that. It's a oh, fantastic awesome. oh, yeah. idea. We have all these acronyms that we just throw out there. I know. I know. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Most people probably don't know what this context is. I know. BX <laughs> means basic expert D&D, &D, like the introductory type of D&D &D that was developed after OD&D &D while AD&D &D was being advanced Dungeons and Dragons. First edition was being developed. Anyone and then don't forget about Beck me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. And then like the different iterations of BX and like all of its different, like the, the Cook versus Moldve and Menser. And it's, I don't know if the nuance is worth knowing unless you like D&D history, but um, there's all of that. It's all basically the same game. Yeah. 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 There was a cool, qu okay, did you, hoping to get physical copy? Oh yeah, anything that I have in physical print, I, um, besides like the premium edition of Shadow Dark, I'm going to be reordering print runs of as needed as long as there's interest in them so so yes shadow dark books are actually going to be for sale like probably by the end of the month on my website oh that's cool yeah so soon <laughs> really soon um how did you come up with giving the monsters one simple ability oh thanks i think it's brilliant and fun to figure out what each monster thank you that that came from 
the fact that I like monsters having unique abilities. Like, I think that in, like, basic expert D&D, there are a lot of monsters that were just a stat line. And that's fine, but you can add a little more nuance to them, which we saw expand huge, like, we saw this, like, huge expansion of monster abilities in 3rd edition and then an eventual condensing down towards 5th edition of that feature. And so I wanted each monster to have an ability that was very reflective of its, like, prime quality, like, its most notable quality. Um, And that involved, like, cutting down a lot of stuff, too. Like, if you look at an Abolith in Shadow Dark and you look at an Abolith in 5th edition D&D, um, you can see that I cut some of the Abolith's features, but not any that anyone cared about, I don't think. I kept its primary ones. Um, so yeah, so giving monsters a little bit of unique flavor is totally worth it in my opinion. Um, but there's very easily a way to go overboard on that, and so you gotta keep it reined in. Mm-hmm. If the monster's too complicated to run without reading it like twice, it's too complicated. Yeah. Because it's going to die soon anyway. <laughs> it's, only, it's walking on and walking off. So like being so complicated is almost never worth it. Um, oh, hi, Kelsey. Could you talk about your approach to class design and shadow dark? Oh, that's really nice. I wanted class design to be the, one of the easiest and most fun things to do in the game. Because I wanted, like, especially like the third party, to make a ton of classes. Or make classes for your home game. Or classes just for your world. Or for this adventure. Um, and the, the real theory behind it is that each class is supposed to not necessarily be perfectly balanced against the other classes. I feel like that's a sacred cow. Instead, each class should be the best at what its chosen feature is. So fighters are the best at swinging weapons. Priests are the best at healing people. Thieves are the best at exploration-based skills. Um, pit fighters are the best at not dying. <laughs> Witches are the best at um, controlling magic. Like, so... So is like I think that niche protection is more important than balance. And I would so agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And that's the philosophy behind classes. And then keep them simple. Only give them a few things. Give them stuff that scales with their level if you can. And if they don't have that, then give them some good stuff at first level so that they stay relevant um, as the other classes around them are scaling. That's it. Yeah. 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 The assassin class you made is super fun. It's probably the most complex class I think you've made. One of them, yeah. Yeah, because it has like two leveling tables. Yeah. Where you level up and get an ability, or you eat a black lotus petal. Yeah. TM. Yeah. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the me to that. that. That's funny. The Razgo Die, that's what the assassin class is called. It's in Curse Scroll 2. Those came out of an adventure I wrote for 5th edition, and... Someone in the Discord, in my Discord server, recently noticed that all of my fifth edition material has world continuity with all of my Shadow Dark material. Oh, that I didn't notice that. They that's reference cool. each other sometimes. Oh, that's and, awesome. And, and I because it's because I'm writing from my own home game world when I'm writing this material, regardless of system. Okay, so I got to ask you this: mm-hmm. your game world, because mm-hmm. this blows my mind. People who make a single game world. You've mm-hmm. made one game world. How long have you been playing in this game world? It's, it's grown every time I've run a session in it because it started as nothing. And like it's been a completely, it, it's a self-expanding game world that either fits the need of an, an adventure that I want to write or a place that my players are going. So it's, it's just grown over time. It's not even fully coherently mapped. Hmm. But that's so for 10 years. Really? Yeah. Man, that's so interesting to me. Because I I view game to, like game worlds as just so disposable. Yeah. But like I'll play a six month campaign and ball up all the paper from it and throw it in the trash and mm-hmm. start completely over again and never reference the other part of that. No, never reference the other thing. You don't have to, right? You don't yeah. have to reference the other thing. You could have a part of your game world that's totally isolated from the others, and retroactively justify why it's still part of your game world. Maybe like, I I don't know. It it just it, it it's never something that I've. I guess I'm just asking, like, it's never something I've considered as something that I should or could or would do or that other people do, in fact, do. Mm -hmm. But then I start, like, poking around on the internet, and I I feel like at least the people, and so maybe it's a hyper-reality problem, (laughs) the people who are talking about this online... They're the ones who are, like, making this expansive game world that goes on and on forever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, whether they're, you know, armchair D&D players or actual D&D players, mm-hmm. like, the experience is 
the same? I don't know. Chat, tell us. Yeah. I Am mean, I crazy? Right. <laughs> is is I, I I don't know if PDM is still in the chat. I don't know if he had to go, but he's been running a, a, a game for his players, some of whom have been playing in the same game for like 25 years. Mm-hmm. Is it all the same world? Like, or mostly the same world. I know that PDM has taken dips into different genres and stuff with the same group. But right. like when he's playing classical fantasy, is it all the same world? I don't know. I bet. Maybe. And then the other thing about it is like it for me, this only works if I only expand the world when I need to. Hmm. Like I don't sit down and start world designing. Like world designing responds to the needs of what I'm writing or what my players are doing. And like it only is expanded out that far. So that keeps it manageable mm-hmm. and, and it makes it easier to cross reference between things because it's not like the Forgotten Realms where like you accidentally, like you talk to one person in this town and it turns out they're like the cousin of that person who's actually the king of that realm or whatever. Like that's not that hyper connected mm, and it can't okay. be or else it would become cumbersome. Right. Yeah. There's yeah. a few named characters who are present throughout. Very few. Very, very few. Right. Like Drusilla, if anyone knows who I'm referencing with that in the, in Curse Roll 1. I also wrote an adventure that she's in. Menezusa, who's a enemy that is the leader of the Rascodai. Maybe an enemy. A few yeah. people. Just okay. a few people. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Wylock, thanks for donating again. Hey, thank you. <laughs> See, Dungeon Craft, it's the same world since 1993. I designed the same way. How old was I in 1993? Let me think about that for a second. Where's my... I was in grade school. Was, was I in kindergarten? No, no. I was in kindergarten in 91. Hold on. I graduated in 2004. I was in first grade. You were in first grade? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was 11. I was, yeah, 90... That was, I had been playing D&D for one year. Aw, <laughs> I started around 11 as well. I think yeah. I was 11 or 12 when I started okay. playing. Yeah, so you were, you were a little bit ahead of me, but... Shoot! So PDM's been running the longest continuous game world ever <laughs> and says... And he says he only plans one session ahead. I know that Hank from Runehammer really only plans one session ahead. Like, truly. And, and it... That also is mind blowing. It to is, me. and he, in particular, one thing I really like about his work, like if you guys have read his Worlds book for Index Card RPG, or you just look through Master Edition or anything, or even across game systems that he designs, there is world continuity between a lot of them. Like, oh, it's crazy. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And because I think he also uses this expand as needed, and he also allows his players and his home games to impact the canon of his game world. Mm-hmm. And like I've gotten to do that once or twice, playing a game with them. That's cool. Yeah, and it's really cool. It's really, really amazing to, as a player, to know that your actions are impacting the game world in such a way. It's special. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's that also is really mind-boggling to me because like, I'll plan out enough meat so that I have surface for gameplay mm-hmm. for probably six months worth of content. Yeah. Like I, I don't I don't plan out like what is happening in the next session. Like that is also weirdly foreign to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm like, I need enough to where I can very easily react to whatever the hell the players want to do in any given direction. Like if they're just in the middle of a dungeon and decide, let's go clear across the map. Cool. I got you fam. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, Mm -hmm. that's you see, I've always wondered how you approach this because you have a lot of knowledge about geopolitical things and geo geopolitics yeah 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 and so like you have a way of looking at a game world like by the way fair and analysis you did a you did an amazing video that's like totally a huge hit yeah analyzing studios shared the video i found out yes yes and like it's been getting a huge surge in views because of um baldur's Baldur's gate Gate. and stuff explaining fair and and, like you have a holistic way of looking at a map and a Mm -hmm. game world and seeing how they all impact each other I don't think many people have that level of knowledge about it. Sure. So like, yeah. No, I, I totally recognize that. Yeah. Which yeah. is cool. It's an, it's really cool because I feel like you have a way of designing outside in. Right. Whereas I have to design design inside out. And if like right. my my if I ever tried to put my game world into a coherent map, it would probably completely fail the sniff test for being realistic. I don't know. I don't. I, I'm not sure of that it's a fantasy world. It's right. all unrealistic. Right, but like geographically speaking, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. it wouldn't be as coherent as like a world that was set up understanding like cli- the way the climate impacts the regions. Mm. And... I, th- I think when you start getting into stuff like that, like yes, it can add value, but it, mm-hmm. it also is a little pedantic. Ah, you know, no, like, but... it, does like like rivers can flow uphill. 
<laughs> in, in a fantasy world. Like, let's be honest here. Yeah. Like, those kinds of things can be informative of your game design, but, mm-hmm. like, uh, I, th- I think, I don't know, there's a lot of technique for geopolitical strategy that I do apply to world building. That And this is something that I'll, I tried to record a talk, but the recording failed no. at Mythicon. But I just got approved to give the same talk at Gen Con this year. <gasps> This year, I will be at Gen Con doing a one-hour-long masterclass on geopolitical world building. So come to that if you're going to be at Gen Con. Oh my gosh, come um, to Gen Con. We're all going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, no, like, I'll show you how, like, one lazy Saturday's worth of prep will give you an entire year's worth of content, basically, with no more than 10 minutes of prep between sessions. Like, that's that's the goal. Wow. So, like, it, it is really interesting to me when, it, when I hear people say, I only pre- prep for the next session. Because I'm like, it, like, it, it breaks my brain. I want to I wanna understand how people do that and it not just feel like a completely noodly spaghetti world. It, I mean, it, it can. You, yeah. People, you know what's funny is people say that they only prep for the next session, but they are doing that in the context of what they know is the world backdrop. Like, mm, yeah, yeah, like yeah. you have to know a little bit about what's going on in your world at large because mm-hmm. it, it, would, it would be very blinders on to only be making the next session without at least some surrounding possible paths and stuff. So it, it is misleading when people say they only do one adventure prep because they're doing that in the context of knowing enough about the world around where the players are. Right. Yeah. You have, yeah. So it, there's a balance. But I would, I would love... To hear like a, a like a video of yours, like I know you're gonna give a talk on it, but I also yeah. Do well, I want to record it so yeah. that I can p- put it online. Yeah, yeah. yeah. About I, mean, I like, could I could do it like on a live stream or as a recording, but and and like yeah. do it with the chat. But having like the dialogue of the audience, I think, is really useful for that kind of talk. Yeah. I don't know. What about like a top five mistakes about geopolitical setup that people make when designing their game world? Like. You like like you you noticed some in the Faerun video. Yeah, it's worth watching because you notice like why is this city not the richest city on the map? Right, like it should yeah. be the richest city. Yeah, but maybe like I was also just riffing off the map, so like maybe there's an in lore reason why it's not. You know, I don't maybe. know. Maybe maybe I don't know. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't. I don't even like calling them necessarily mistakes. I think it's just a, a good idea to like recognize that. Maybe in a in a normal mundane world, this mm-hmm. is the way it would be. Mm-hmm. And having an sometimes if you go really fantastical, it's and you see this a lot with sci-fi, especially mm-hmm. people who don't write hard sci-fi, that you know, like the the technology gets away from their understanding of like thinking through the knock-on ripple effects of like how society would react to this technology existing mm. and. You know, it sounds a little silly, but, like, the concept of colonialism and mercantilism was only made possible because of gunpowder and the galleon sail rigging. Like, those two advances in technology suddenly changed the geopolitical zeitgeist of the world for nearly 400 years. Wow. You know? Like, that became the new status quo until finally the Industrial Revolution started happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the... It's, it's, and we're still, I still think like we're in the middle, uh, we're probably at the end of the industrial revolution now, Hmm. but it's still ongoing. Like ask any historian about, I'm getting really noodly here. (laughs) (laughs) Ask any historian about like, are we still in the agricultural revolution? Probably, you know, it's, it's not, it's not like this, you know, finite thing that happened. It just changes course over time. So just like recognizing that there are, like people have resources and people are scared to lose them mm-hmm. and just think through what each faction's resources are and how they would react with the tools they have at hand to losing the resources they have at hand. That's basically the, the, the gist of what this kind of strategy is, that is for world building. I love that you acknowledge or that you're the first person to say that you can get too noodly with this stuff yeah. because like it is easy to like think that world building is just an exercise in reflecting the real world and 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 it's not right but yeah. having some of the knowledge that you have could allow you to set up really interesting like conflicts or or 
things that that make the world kind of come to life that might have been outside of our normal consideration yeah. also yeah. which is really cool it's just another tool to make the world more interesting right yeah, yeah. as long as you, but you don't want to go overboard in any regard on any type of world building front right yeah yeah uh, just basically the lesson is people are scared to lose their stuff yeah so think about what how they would react when they lose their stuff given the tools that they have to protect it Mm, <laughs> that's, that's that's basically that's it. even true on a micro level in a <laughs> yeah. dungeon yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure yeah. absolutely that like you can wrong. do that kind of analysis inside of a mega dungeon or in a 25 room dungeon mm-hmm. yeah. a baron plays Civ once you play it more than once yeah <laughs> <laughs> um what is what else have we got advice from an improv gm let the players find out why it's not the richest city yeah doc that's, yeah yeah absolutely that that's true like It'd be fun to come up with an explanation for why that is and having yeah. that knowledge. Again, it creates it creates an adventure hook right there. For sure. Like, you wouldn't have even thought of it. Like, oh, wait, this should have been the richest city, but it's not. Why? Well, now you have a cool thing to rip on. Yeah. Right. Like um, Argentina. That should be the richest continent or richest nation in the world, in my opinion. But, hmm. you know, neither here nor there. There have been problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there have been roadblocks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm looking through and see if we had any other outstanding questions. Yeah, we've been going for like an hour and a half. Oh, my gosh. We've been really How bad. much money have we raised? Somebody in the chat tell me. I'm going to look on the phone. It's a race now. It's a race. Oh, my gosh. I like the... Um, we have 185 people in the chat. There's people, so many people in this room. People are like, how did you guys... <laughs> how did Baron and Kelsey get in the same room? Well, <laughs> he, I saw him wandering around outside and I felt bad and I was like do you need shelter and so I was like okay I was just lost in the ether of the internet saying yeah is anyone here <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh Scott's here too hello from Argentina hi Santiago hello um Caesar they beat me to it wow I'm amazed we had such a like amazing audience for this too like so many cool people have been showing up and really good questions Thank you for your donation to Develop Africa. Someone anonymously did Anonymously, that. which just pushed us over 300. Oh, no! <laughs> what can be a feat of strength that you could do? Yeah, three, I don't know. I have no... I, I, I was really just talking out of my rear. But. I know. <laughs> we, can, we can talk hypothetically about the feats of strength we think you could do. Uh, for Yeah, okay. If you held your arm straight out, could I hang off of it like a monkey no, bar? Absolutely not. Okay. No way. That would be too no, hard. No, yeah. I don't know anything <laughs> about lifting weights. I don't, <laughs> no, no, no. I, holy cow. There's no, no way. No point reference for strength training. None. I might yeah. be able to do a third of you. On a, a lift? Ladder. On a lift? Yeah, with a, with a lateral. I might be able to do what? What do you weigh? Like 100 pounds? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I might be able to do 35 pounds. So I would that have would, to... And that would be hard. I would have to be in the shape of like a barbell <laughs> bar in order to be liftable in a conventional manner. Yeah, it, like yeah. If, if you were to sit on my shoulders, I could like... I could do probably... I, I would say 30 squats. <laughs> <laughs> I could drag you all the way down the block. Before, before, before it, it would be more of an endurance test than yeah. anything. It's like, how many could I actually do? Oh, uh, man. This is ridiculous. We're not going to do this. No, we can't do feats of strength. It's too dangerous. Do you see this fire right here? It's so hot. It's I so know. hot. Not, ne- not necessarily a question about Shattered Arc, but what are your favorite mega dungeons? Ooh. Um, okay, I think I have a maybe controversial opinion on this. I believe that Caverns of Thracia is a mega dungeon and therefore it is my favorite one. I agree, agree with you. It's I just think, barely a mega dungeon. I, I think that a mega dungeon is anything larger than 25 rooms. Okay. Like, I, mm. I think the definition of a mega dungeon is way too strong. Like, the, the, the flagpole has been planted at a far too high a number to where, like, how many people actually go through the entirety of Caverns of Thracia and see every room? Not one, and, yeah. And most players go through it and never even see half. Isn't it? So, yeah, it's so and, and it's only like, what, 70-something rooms? It's, if that? It gets high. It gets up there. Like yeah. I think, like, conventionally speaking, it gets up into the hundreds. But there are whole subsections of the dungeon that you can utterly bypass and miss. and even Completely like, bypass. And they're some of the coolest parts of the dungeon, too. But, like... Do you know the amount of restraint it must have taken to write like some of the coolest material in the dungeon and, and just know that your character, your players might not see it? Yeah. That takes it's, a lot of restraint. It's, yeah. I think what's really fascinating to me is, and this is something, I, I've talked about this with Leif from Devs and Dice. So if you're into uh, like terrain building, he's got a great, I mean, Wylock's in the chat right now. Go check out his channel. 
But also, Leif from Devs and Dice does fantastic uh, Warhammer terrain. But uh, he is a video game developer by trade. And I got to talking to him about level design in video games. And I was like, why is it exactly that nobody makes like really expansive mega dungeons that you can easily get lost in? Like even Skyrim in its largest dungeon that takes you down to the mushroom forest underneath a, a dwarven city, you could be delving this dungeon for two and a half, three hours of gameplay, but you're going to see every bit of it because it's almost an entirely linear path. Mm. And Leif just hit it on it right on the nail head. Why would the, why would the management team want developers making parts of a game that they're not sure like it's okay to have an easter egg but why would you make huge parts of the game that you're not sure the players are ever going to see that's so, inefficient yeah yeah it's like it's like a total waste of economic resource yeah. to do this but in the in the context of a tabletop rpg you're not spending a whole like the amount of effort that it takes to make an easter egg as like an, an off an off secret room in a in a video game level is about as much time as it takes to make 40 damn rooms <laughs> in a mega dungeon. Yeah. You know? it's Wow, that's so true. I feel like one of the beautiful things about tabletop gaming is that it can it, it can operate outside of those restrictions very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it just is what it is. It takes less effort to make a dungeon for a role-playing game than it does to make a whole video game level. Right. So, yeah. But, like, but it is interesting, like, the other cost is, like, the emotional grief of, like, should you keep the secret doors from your players? Like, it's it's a weird philosophical question. I... Like, why would you design... Why would you design all this cool content and not show it to your players? So, one of the flaws of, of Thracia is that, in my opinion, the secret doors are too hard to find. No, I agree. And, and that... Because, I mean, like, Janelle was creating a, an entire category of dungeon for the first time in history in designing this so of course there are going to be things that we have maybe now come to agree or could could have been done slightly differently but I, I, like having a secret door is good as long as there's enough of a tell that it's worth yes. looking there like there should be some sort of telegraph yeah even think, even yeah. if the even if it's on completely on the other side of the dungeon yes like ha finding a wizard's old notebook saying i went through the secret door by you know the dragon statue yeah. oh crap now we need to go be looking for the secret door yeah we, we need to go back there you know because what it ultimately is is a reward for the players yes for smart play so you like there's a balance between making it too hard to find and not, you know. Right. So I would I would err on the side of easier to find. And also inside of dice, thank you very much for mm -hmm. the the riffing of mm -hmm. says the guy who couldn't make a three hundred and sixty five room dungeon in ten hours. Yeah, it was so <laughs> close. We got so close. It was you know what? It was impressive. Breaking three hundred rooms, impressive. Yeah. Yeah. You were the one who almost died from that. <laughs> no, okay, so but a lot of people don't know this from the live stream. Um, if you're not familiar, I did a live stream, what? It was, it was New Year's Eve. Two, like three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Yeah. To design a 365 room mega dungeon. One room for... It was basically the Dungeon 23 Challenge by, issued by Sean McCoy, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. 365 room dungeon. The original goal was one room every day. Like you would wake up in the morning as a ritual while you're drinking your coffee and make a add a room to the dungeon. Mm -hmm. I said, "Screw this! I'm going to do it all in one day, and <laughs> I'm going to do it more. in ten hours." I didn't finish, and I streamed for twelve. I did not eat enough that day, and after the live stream was over, I stood up, and my knees nearly buckled out from underneath me. I did not realize how lightheaded I was. <laughs> I did not realize how little I had eaten. Like I had a, a quarter of a bag of popcorn, a breakfast burrito, and some veggies and dip. And that was it. I don't think I got more than 600 calories that day. I, Because I, I came into the stream late because I was right. totally caught up in doing Kickstarter-related work. And um, you looked like a sled dog in the last 10 miles of the Iditarod. Like you were so <laughs> tired and like you had this like sort of like, I'm going to get it done. Like, yeah. It was energy. just pure grit like, going on at that point. I could tell you were experiencing physical pain like while you were writing. 
I was like, we got a rally. And so, you know, people from my Discord server like showed up and helped. And it was so cool. Like I, I feel like there was a lot of waves of support that yeah. came through throughout was, the day. It was that really I, cool. It, seemed, it was really one of the coolest like of live streamed events I've ever seen. Yeah. At, like, no, 100%. I, yeah. I think what's interesting, like don't even go watch that live stream. Go watch Indestructo Boy's review of the live stream. He was part of the the challenge. He, I had a bunch of different YouTubers, uh, Dungeon Tubers, come, <laughs> dungeon tubers. <laughs> come on the show yeah. with me. But it was so fun to hear what he was saying about that. So go check that out. He too. did an excellent recap, and he really yeah. he really captured my feelings about it too. Where it just felt like this really joyful, collaborative, exciting, fun, playful thing, and that's that's what you hope to get out of this 100%. kind of F. like. Yeah. That's why we do this stuff. Yeah, you know, it's fun. It's yeah. fun to just hang out and. Do Nerd this out about stuff. Yeah. yeah, like, heck, I, 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 that's practically something that if we had all been sitting in the same room together, we would have done anyway. Right. Like, yeah. Runehammer just asked if this fire is CG. Is it CG? <laughs> no, it's it's a what is it the the fabric that ripples. I, don't I, know, it's, I it's actually cool. don't know what it is. It's like somehow it's like a, a screen. Light. It's it's not real fire. It doesn't even put off heat. It can, but it's not. Oh, it's not. It okay. can. It wouldn't be fire-based <laughs> heat. It would be electricity-based heat. Um, man, I missed a few good questions up back. Do we want to scroll up? Can here? we? Because I there was some really good questions yeah, and they slipped my mind. Go ahead and scroll up there if you want. It's, it, it's weird to do it on my phone. Scroll up or down here. There we um, go. How can we play games like three hundred push-ups? Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> I'm not sure I can do three hundred push-ups. I could. I think the most push-ups I can do right now is like sixty. Ooh, here's a really great question from Paladin Pros who makes great videos. Um, yeah, go check out Paladin Pros. He's got some fun videos. Yeah. Some Smaller these, channel, too, so help him blow up. Some of these are related, so maybe we can merge them. How can we play games like Shadow Dark or other rules like games? Okay, I'll sit back by the mic. How can we play games like Shadow Dark or other rules like games but make them more heroic? That's a great question. Okay. Um, Shadow Dark has some modes of play, which Paladin mentioned, um, that try to help with this, but if you really want to look at why those modes exist, what they're trying to do, it's um, in expanding action economy, giving players the ability to do more than one action on their turn in limited situations, because if you do that all the time, the game's going to slow down, um, and um, increasing survivability a little bit, maybe, like... The ability to, but really, in my opinion, the number one thing that makes the game feel more heroic is increasing the action economy for the players only, not the monsters. Really? Yeah, because then hmm. it, it allows them to basically double their effectiveness as a character. And, mm -hmm. and effectiveness is what creates heroicness, you know? So, like, Indiana Jones is a prime example of that. Like, if he weren't effective, he wouldn't be heroic. Hmm, okay. So that's that's my take on it. I think that that's the number one way to make something feel more heroic. And then, of course, with Shadow, you, you may want to increase hit points just a little bit, but you, I don't think you would necessarily need to. Okay. I think that's just a safety valve. I, I think it's interesting you say that because I thought that your pulp-style play, where you start the game with multiple... Uh, luck tokens. That is the that is the heroic mode. Oh, okay. That is the heroic mode. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Which like, gotcha. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. We're, uh, we're talking about different things here. No, okay. I was calling it pulp mode, but like pulp mode to me is like I Conan. think of both Conan and actually Indiana Jones. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, and that's like allowing you to expend um, luck tokens normally as you would, or to get more actions, or to like maximize um, damage or things like that. Mm -hmm. Critical turn hits into critical hits and stuff. So. Yeah, that that I think it's not too hard to make something heroic using those methods. Yeah. Cool. Um now the people were asking like how can we get people to try games that aren't 5e? Tell them that you're playing 5e. And if they don't like it, they can leave. It's that easy. Bring it it's on. That, it's that it's no. no, I'm 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 tired of this. How do I get I, like I'm not trying to razz the chat here. Like, thank you for the question. But just put your foot down, man. <laughs> just put your foot down. And if they don't want to play because they're so obsessed with playing 5e, that's fine. But We're just tough loving you by saying <sighs> that. Because, like, it's funny. Because people just... ask that a lot. It, people do ask that a lot. Although, you know, it, it's a fair question to ask. Because if you love a game and you want to try it, you, you like it feels like you don't want to sour your players on it. You know? Yeah, and so... It... Like, yeah. part of it is, like, get the quick start rules. They're free. That'll take you through, what, third level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, go do that. Convert them that way. 
And if they still don't want to play, go get new friends. <laughs> like, if, if, like seriously, if, if they are so married to 5th edition that they can't respect you as their friend and as their dungeon master, who's clearly putting in the most work to the game, like, if they can't respect that enough of your friendship and the amount of labor you're doing to make them play that they can't adjust to learn a new rule set that is exceptionally easy to learn. And I think that is part of the problem is that 5th edition is a difficult system to learn and that once they've learned it, there's a lot of emotional connection to learning a system that is negatively related. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do it with a quick the quick start rules. Show them that the booklet is super tiny. You know, if if you really want to hold their hand into it, but gosh, just go get new friends and who have no concept of what playing D and D is like. Just drop the quick start rules in front of them. Hey, these these are the simple rules that we're gonna play for a game like D and D. It's kind of based on it. It's almost like it. This is what we're doing now. We're playing Shadow Dark. I don't know. I agree. I I'm a little sociopathic about it because D and D is more important than friends. Okay, that's not that's not true. D and D friends are more important more than important friends. More important than friends. <laughs> Maybe they're not mutually exclusive. You know, like yeah, they shouldn't be mutually exclusive. You need one to have the other generally. But I I agree. I think that like if you want if you want your players to like a new system and they're very tied to D and D as a brand. I get it because I've been there too. Like D and D as the brand is what convinced me to play Fourth Edition. Um, I won't comment further. I, I, I think that I, I wasn't saying anything. I, I couldn't. I couldn't disguise my vague dislike. No, I played a lot of Fourth Edition. Tons of stuff I liked about it, but it's the system. It's the edition that I probably um, least wanted to continue playing. You know. And anyway, like D&D as a brand is very powerful and there's a fallacy of sunk cost into, you know, the notion that because you've invested so much in something, it is therefore more valuable and that you can't walk away from it. And so I think that knowing that, p that players kind of subconsciously suffer from those beliefs kind of helps you pitch new games to them being like, hey, this is old school D&D. You can say that. You could say that about Cairn or Shadow Dark. You could, even, you could say that about ICRPG. You could say that about Deathbringer. Like, it is old school D&D &D at its core, so it's not unfair to label it that way. And I think that that's a way to convince brand lovers over to trying new games. And the other thing is, like, put on your tux and give them the best show they've ever had that night. Like, really try to sell it. Like, invest the effort in making something cool. Make a really fun session. Like, you know, put its best foot forward. And run a one shot of it, and then maybe it'll stick. And another one is don't forget my step grandmother's words of wisdom. You're gonna live until you're 80. <laughs> it, What's up? Based on my YouTube demographic information, that means that most of you are 28 to 34 years old. That means there's still a long time that you can go back and play 5th edition if you really want to. So there's nothing wrong with trying Shadow Dark, mm -hmm. you know? And recall that Wizards of the Coast has dropped the prior edition of D&D like a hot bag of rocks and have suddenly branded it as not D&D. Like, have you noticed this? Like, the prior editions of D&D are, are, like, disallowed from carrying the weight of the D&D brand in, in the way that they pitch things. It's almost like they're scorned now. Like, they used to be the thing of the moment. They used to be the brand, and now they're just thrown out and kicked into the gutter. So, like, the idea of what D&D &D is, even to Wizards of the Coast, changes all the time. That's an interesting point that I hadn't thought of. That is true. They've completely abandoned, like, yeah. basic expert D&D. &D. Yeah. They're like, that's not real D&D. &D. You know? And, the, <laughs> and it is. It's, like, one of the most real D&Ds there is, you know? So, Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it is D&D. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The disowned editions, someone said. The disowned editions. said that. The disowned editions. It's oh, true. That's so funny. Yeah. So just remember that the brand itself is not just only the current edition of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else? Do we have any other questions? We've been going for almost two hours. What, what systems do you think simulationist rules work best for versus where abstraction works best? Okay, so my favorite simulationist on the planet is Trevor Duvall. He loves simulation style games and he's kind of like the, the champion of simulationist style games because I think more people are less preferential toward it. And hmm. he loves Harn and... It has I've never played Harn. Me neither. I don't even think I've read it. Can we get him to run it for us? Yes, Trevor, are you in the chat? <laughs> Please Come run play it for with us. Harn for us. I want. 
I, because it's it's got a lot of really fun simulationism to it. And I had a, I had a long chat with him once about it, um, where he kind of persuaded me that that you actually can extract a lot of creativity out of the nuanced role tables and stuff because it takes you away from your cliches. It, it forces you to come up with results that you would have never anticipated, and it really does actually boost creativity in a lot of ways. So hmm. I think simulationist games like Harn have a lot a lot of merit and are worth scoping out and are highly regarded by people who love simulationist games. And we should try it sometime. Okay. Yeah. And now you just off of that, just because Trevor likes it, I'm gonna download it and read it now. He says it's a hard it's a hard one to just enter like it's it's hard to get through the gate of the game that it's difficult to Hmm. absorb and implement but that he finds it well worth it okay so, yeah, cool a fun intellectual exercise interesting mm -hmm. cool. yep. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not a fan of shadow darks bard that's okay marcus aurelius i'm not a fan of your philosophy <laughs> 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 no i'm not i think stoicism is just fine that's it's so just funny. fine marcus aurelius stoicism is useful when you have to deal with misery if your default is misery, stoicism is the philosophy for you. Oh, that's... <laughs> is that harsh? I need to not respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> On that I'm note... I'm totally razzing you, Marcus. <laughs> I, I, it's okay if you don't like the bard. It's not a core class. It's okay. There's classes that people don't like, even within a game that they like. It's, I'm just joking. Just joking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, do we want to wrap it up here? We've been going for about two hours. Do we have any last minute okay. questions? I'm checking our chat. Yep. The table in dark. I think, you know, I think that's, I think that's a good stopping point. Okay. Like I, right. Cause we covered yeah. fun. We've talked about a lot of stuff. I totally poked fun at the philosophy of stoicism and yeah. you know, it's okay. I, I and you've I opened the door anything. for me to start talking about that, which means I need to sign off. Oh no. Oh no. Someone who actually knows what he's talking about. We got to leave way now. Way too much political philosophy. I don't know anything about it. I know nothing. I know it's nothing. all useless. That's all you need to know. Oh no. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, if, go check out the Arcane Library on YouTube and check out uh, Shadow Dark at thearcanelibrary.com. And uh, also, if you want to support making more content like this in the future, please consider su supporting me and Kelsey Dion on Patreon. Uh, well, you don't have a Patreon. No, so but you could buy my stuff if you want. Buy her stuff. That's, anyway, yeah. thanks for joining us, everybody. Good night. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> I was mean to Marcus Aurelius. <laughs>